Don mentioned, we'll cover a couple of topics today um, uh, to go over the basics of the uh, mass spec technology that we have developed, that we entered a partnership with Agent with, and we'll cover um, some of the basics uh, of the um, operation with GCMSD um, and some interesting applications too, uh, as well as um, LCMSD, uh, which became another a part of the partnership we entered into uh, with Agilent. Um, and finally, we'd like to show you some, uh, um, a, a new piece of software that Don mentioned uh, GC, uh, for GCMS um, quantitative analysis as a production tool, uh, GCID, before we turn into uh, Q&A where we would uh, open uh, the forum for, uh, for questions and answers and for discussions. Um, the, so a couple words about the company um, and the technology and the product that we developed. Um, the, the company studied in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, we have moved to um, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada last year. Uh, we specialize uh, in mass spec calibration and analysis. Uh, we have quite a few patents, uh, 17 patents and counting. Um, it covers uh, the calibration and the analysis aspects of the technology. Uh, we built the first generation product called MassWorks, which uh, most of you have uh, purchased uh, through Agilent, presumably. Uh, it's a standalone post acquisition package. Uh, we started out with, with version one. Um, we went to pick and got the most innovative um, um, medal, bronze medal uh, for the year when we went to the show. Uh, now it has uh, evolved into version six, which we have just released. It supports nearly all mass spec systems, but for hardware and engineering reasons, it works the best on the Agile and MSD system. We have over uh, close to 2000 customers now in US, Canada, Europe, Japan, China. Uh, we have now built a second generation product for fully automated analysis, the GCID, in which you will hear something more about later. The key function of the MassWorks software is really the only approach for accurate mass analysis and thereby to perform the formula determination, elemental composition determination and compound ID on the quadruple system. But our real key contribution to the field we felt is something that's uh, somewhat uh, orthogonal to that, um, but it's an integral part of it. It's called the idea of spectral accuracy. I'd like to spend a couple minutes walking you through about the idea of spectral accuracy, um, how it can be achieved, and and how, how useful can, can it be in the mass spec analysis. To give you some basic ideas for those of you who are not familiar with the technology. So in mass spectrometry, whenever you turn the mass spec detector on, the detector is busy collecting signals. As the ion arrive at the detector, in this case, the monoisotope arriving and disappearing, the, re the detector faithfully record the arrival and the disappearance of that particular ion. It has a spread um, in a tiny region which defines the resolution. And then it faithfully record the arrival of the plus one and the plus two, in addition to its spread, of course, and the plus two and the plus three. So the detector records a full profile raw data continuously, nonstop. For historical reasons, mostly about data rate and data compression, um, traditionally and by default, even those days, um, the detector, the mass spec system is set up to acquire data in the century mode. The sensory mode produces one stick where the detector sees a peak. And the plus two, plus the plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on and so forth. Which is a very highly efficient compression technique. It reduces the data by a factor of 10 and allow you to do a lot of things um, already, including quantitative analysis. But you might have wondered in this uh, dramatic data compression process, what information might have been lost and how important those kind of information is for other type of analysis, such as qualitative analysis. 
So to answer that question, we went back to the uh, fundamentals, the basics. We calculate for a given, for a given elemental composition with 25 carbon, 23 hydrogen, and so on and so forth, the theoretical true mass spec, which you can do in mass spectrometry very accurately to the fifth decimal point. And the true mass spec on the first look doesn't look like a century spectrum because so all you see at this scale is sticks located at roughly plus monoisotope plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on and so forth locations. However, the true mass spec contains all the information. So you can actually blow up the plus one and see there are additional isobars right next to each other in a very narrow window, which are indicative of the higher isotopes present given the elemental composition. So it can tell you whether you have um, carbon-13, which typically dominates, or sulfur-33, or nitrogen-15, and so on and so forth. So it actually contains a lot more information, which otherwise would have been lost due to centroiding, because centroiding would only produce a single stick here. If you go to plus two and blow it up, it contains even more information, much richer information, because there are many ways to produce a plus two isotopes. And they can tell you whether you have sulfur and whether you have carbon-13 or you have nitrogen or oxygen in various combinations. So the true mass spec actually contain a lot more information, in particular, in terms of the type of elements that may be involved, that may be important, very important for qualitative analysis, which would have gotten lost in the centroiding process. So we went ahead and did a computer simulation, not to do any centroiding, but for those five elemental compositions, we calculate out the true profile mode mass spec data, what they should look like. And that's what, um, what those five different elemental compositions would look like. The five different elemental compositions share, some, share a common property. That is the monoisotope mass is right on top of each other. It's within 0.1 ppm of each other. But they have very different elemental compositions and therefore they have very different profile mode to mass spec. Now, as such a resolving power, you cannot tell the difference between the various uh, higher isotopes, whether they, the plus one, for example, is being contributed by nitrogen 15, sulfur 33, or carbon 13, or um, hydrogen two. However, the mass spec, especially a well-engineered mass spec, can faithfully combine the various higher isotopes and give you an overall profile that's a truly representative of the particular combination of the atoms and elements and their higher isotopes. Thereby they review the possible elemental composition. So that, that gives us confidence that it might be possible to determine elemental composition using even a quadruple system. As long as we keep the profile data and the raw profile data acquired and saved and analyzed in the profile mode without the centroiding process. That all sounds like a great idea. So we went ahead and tried it uh, like any good scientist would do. We go to the lab and we perform the calibration. We perform the data analysis and we tried it out. And the first thing we saw was that it was not going to work. The reason it was not going to work is traced back to how mass spec is conventionally calibrated. So for example, in this case, um, um, the mass spectrometer um, during either the instrument calibration process or the tune process would, ask, would measure a calibration tune compound in the profile mode, uh, maybe at the firmware level, and then it will calculate the peak apex position for this particular known calibration or tune compound. And that peak apex position would then be compared to the theoretically calculated mass spec, its theoretical peak apex position, 
and there would be inevitably a mass error. And that mass error would then be calibrated through the tune process or through the instrument calibration. But the conventional calibration would do nothing more than simply move the actual measured black trace to line up in terms of peak apex with the theoretically calculated mass back. And that's the end of the conventional calibration. That calibration serves um, the accentuating processing well, because after that, if you do accentuating, you'll get one centroid here at more or less the right location, more or less the right amplitude, another centroid here for plus one. And if you're lucky with the right set of parameters, you get this, the, the plus two centroid as well. And then you go ahead and do your rough quantitation or a quantitative analysis to, fix, to see if you indeed see the ion at 260. And you would not have noticed anything amiss or anything different. However, in order to keep all the information in the, in the pro process in the profile mode and analyze in the profile mode, we see that the traditional conventional calibration is not sufficient. It leaves a lot of spectral error in the rest of the spectral region. And that spectral error is uh, in the order of um, five to 10%, per perhaps more than sufficient to, um, to obscure or destroy the difference we want to see between one elemental composition and another. So that would not allow us to, de to determine elemental composition by using conventional mass spec calibration approach. So we had to come up with a different approach to perform the calibration, which can, in the process, using the same experiment, using the same standard even, but perform the calibration differently so that after calibration, we produce a red trace that can be superimposed quantitatively on top of the theoretical mass spec. And thereby, by calib thereby calibrating both the mass error in terms of the X and y, X location, but also calibrate the peak shape so that after calibration, the calibrated mass spec would be quantitatively accurate compared to the theoretical mass spec in the spectral full spectral profile mode basis. And thereby we achieve both mass accuracy and spectral accuracy. So because of the calibration we perform, um, we obviously correct the mass shift between the raw data and the calibrated version. And that shift can be quite significant on a quadruple system on the order of uh, point X for decimal point. But after calibration, we can move it to the correct location and thereby increase the mass accuracy by a factor of 100 to the third decimal point, to 0 0.00x. And the reason we can achieve that fundamentally is because we calibrate the peak shape so that even though the, it's, a, it's a unit mass resolution, the peak is still pretty wide at 0.5 or 0.7 AMU. We can, because we know the peak shape, we can determine the peak position a hundred times better. And that gives us a hundred times more mass accuracy, which is remarkable when you think about it. Uh, the question is a hundred times more mass accuracy, would that be sufficient to perform elemental composition determination? Well, if we convert that the five plus minus five mini Dalton, the third decimal points kind of mass error at 400, the MU that translates to about 12.5 ppm mass error. And that mass, mass error is one standard deviation. So when we try to determine unknown, we want to enlarge that by at least um, factor of two or factor of three even. So let's say we go to two sigma, two times the standard error. When we search for possible unknown and unknown elemental composition, we want to search within plus minus 24 ppm. And with carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, the typical suspects, how many possible elemental composition would we get? Well, it turned out we would get um, a total of 61, which is a daunting task 
um, in order to sort out which one of the 61 will be the right uh, candidates. That's why the mass accuracy by itself is typically not sufficient. And that's where the spectral accuracy comes into play. So what spectral accuracy allows us to do is to produce a theoretically calculated mass spec for each and every one of the 61 candidates and thereby allowing us the software to quantitatively overlay on top of the calibrated mass spec. So as here, as you can see, the number 61, there's no way for it to be the correct answer because there's so much mass error, there's so much spectral error rather in under plus one and under plus two. And for those of you who are into uh, spectral interpretation and elemental isotopes, you can immediately see that it has too many sulfurs. With five sulfurs in the elemental composition, the plus two is way overestimating. And it might not have enough carbons because the carbon 13 dominate the plus one. And on the plus one, we are underestimating. So if you go up the list to 90% spectral accuracy, um, you get better and better uh, match between the theoretically calculated mass spec and calibrated mass spec. And go up furthermore to number 20 hates, you get 93% spectral accuracy, which is still not good enough. But it might have gotten the cost sulfur number right, because the plus two is right on the money here. So it might indeed require one sulfur. And this computer sort out for you as you go up to higher and higher uh, spectral accuracy to 95% here, for example, um, um, as the number 10 hits, which is still way off with 5% spectral error. You can do better than that to number five hits, um, which uh, give you a good match on the plus one, indicating the carbon number is, um, is very close, but the sulfur number is still off, it's underestimating. And it's not surprising that all top four contain exactly one sulfur, and, and it, the correct answer is indeed in the top four. You can tell top th number three is not the right answer because the carbon number is off. Between the top one and two, we can't really tell the difference between, because the spectral accuracy is 98.7 versus 98.6, but we can narrow it down to the top two uh, from a total of 61 candidates. So that's how, that's how important spectral accuracy is. And that's how we perform elemental composition using high enough mass accuracy combined with very high spectral accuracy on a quadruple system. So we we figure that um, the idea of spectral accuracy, which has not been much discussed in the field um, by the community, um, um, uh, we uh, coined this, this we coined this word uh, spectral accuracy to quantitatively measure the difference between the calibrated and the theoretical mass spec as another matrix in addition to and on top of the mass accuracy. Uh, it's such an important concept that we decided to publish a paper in, in analytical chemistry, which was featured in the front cover um, uh, to describe the rationale behind um, spectral accuracy, how to achieve it through the calibration process and some of its important applications. And this um, um, feature article is freely downloadable from our website um, uh, because it's a front cover feature. You, there's no royalty owed to the, um, um, to the ACS. So we encourage you to share this uh, publication with your colleagues um, uh, and friends uh, in the mass spec community who may be interested in learning more about how it works, why it works, and why it matters. So now I'd like to. Um, uh, say a few words about um, our um, partnership with Agilent. Um, so the commercial software we build, um, we, we build into called MassWorks uh, is available on the market uh, for quite a, quite a number of years. And in time, we um, enter into a partnership with Agilent, with Agilent for them to, uh, to package and bundle a version of MassWorks for GCMSD uh, for new system purchase, there's a particular part number for that. And for new LCMSD system, there's a different part number for that. Uh, because it's specially configured version, uh, we are able to make the price highly attractive 
um, when you buy a new MSD system. With a very small amount of incremental uh, cost, you can have MassWorks to go with MSD. In addition to that, um, you also have the ease of use on the GCMSD where a very important, e um, a very easy feature that's available. That's called the AutoCal. You don't have to do the calibration process, process yourself as a user. The software does it all by itself. Very convenient. I will show you uh, some how to do that. And also, you know, to, in addition to um, to the um, ease of use, there is also a unique specification for performance uh, against all other single core systems. You can have mass accuracy of uh, five mini Dalton and spectral accuracy of ninety nine percent for both the GCMSD and the LCMSD system. For those of you who ordered um, the MassWorks package uh, to go with your MSD system, depending on whether you bought with LCMSD or GCMSD, you will receive a package um, from, uh, from the, uh, along with the instruments as part of the instrument shipment. Um, the LCMSD would be indicated for as the MassWorks for LCMSD um, on the package. In addition, at the back of the package, there would be indicated that uh, um, Cerno Bioscience, us, will be responsible for the support. You can contact us through phone call or email. And we also do WebEx um, and room meeting support if you have any particular questions. We're more than happy to um, uh, to work with you and to, to, to get you up and going. going. But um, um, here is the, um, the, the actual contents of the package that's inside the DVD box. So there will be a installation CD um, and there will be a USB dongle that's uh, for the license control. So you can install the CD on the computer, processing computer, but the software will not work until you insert the USB um, license control into the same computer. There's also a very important insert as part of the package, um, which contains some key information on how to get started, how to um, read various uh, type of vendor data, including Chem Station, Mass Hunter, for example, or OpenLab CDS. Um, I will not read through it here because we're gonna go through the actual process uh, here with you today online. Um, we do require some uh, special setup uh, in order to acquire the kind of data for MassWorks. So, and then the setup is slightly different depending on the system you use and depending on the data, data, uh, the data acquisition software. So the, the, the traditional GCMSD with the came station, for example, the setup would involve changing a couple of um, um, mass back acquisition method parameters, including the acquisition mode for the came station, the terminology is a raw scan you have to acquire in the raw scan mode, not the scan or same mode. And then you want to go change the scan parameters to set the threshold to zero so that we actually don't miss any data. We get the true baseline in order to get the true profile data. And then the sampling rate um, in agent terminology is represented by the number of point averaged and so uh, typically we uh, recommend setting it to be a uh, two or three, which correspond to medium um, and, uh, scanning speed in terms of, um, you know, in terms of how many seconds it takes to uh, scan 1,000 AMU. It's uh, right in the middle of the range. And then we need to program the calibration gas, whether you are doing the EI um, mode or the CI mode. Now there's a calibration gas we can turn on by just changing the mass spec um, um, acquisition uh, parameters. You can program a time event to turn the calibration valve on and off, and that's sufficient to produce the calibration data we need. Uh, a couple of notes here. Now, typically, um, you, can you can program the calibration valve to be on and off as part of the same GCMS run, uh, but we'd like you to, um, to cool the GC oven down you can cool down it rapidly at the end of the run to the initial temperature, to the starting temperature before the uh, temperature ramping. The idea is to, um, um, is to reduce the condom bleeding at high temperature so that it does not interfere with the EI calibration gas or CI 
uh, calibration gas if you're running the CI mode. So to reduce the interference, we like you to cool down the oven. So that's another time event um, that you might want to program into the, um, into the GC. And then after the GC programming, you want to come back here um, uh, to adjust the uh, time, the minute, corresponding to when you want to turn the valve on and when you want to turn the valve off. We typically suggest 30 to 60 seconds is more than enough at the end of the run and after the, after the GC is cooled, GC oven is cooled down. Uh, we also recommend to, um, to add another time event just before the uh, calibration gas is turned on to reduce the electron multiplier voltage by about 100 or 200 volt, depending on the age of the detector. And this is uh, to turn down the gain in order to prevent uh, uh, the calibration gas from saturating the detector. Um, so those couple of notes, um, uh, they're all described in a, in a document, which I will show you later on in more detail with a lot of explanations. But that's the setup process for GCMSD under CAM station. Now, nowadays, most of the new GCMSD comes with a mass hunter data acquisition, uh, which uh, pretty much has only uh, a, a single page where you need to make all the setup. So the terminology for acquisition type has been changed to profile instead of centroid or sim. And then the threshold you can change right here on the same page to zero. The scan speed, then we want to change, we want to keep it in the medium range of the scan speed, typically two or three or four. And the time events is very similar to chem station with similar notes and explanations here. And in a minute uh, or two, um, I will be demonstrating to you a couple of uh, key features and some quick uh, sanity checks. Um, so I will not read through this, uh, um, uh, this longer list of um, um, topics I'll be um, I'll be demonstrating to you, walk you through uh, with the MassWorks software, but this is just here for the um, recording purpose and for reference purpose. For, um, for LCMSD, if you're running LCMSD under Chem Station software, yeah, here's the setup page. Uh, the data acquisition mode is called scan. So it's a different terminology. So um, 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 that uh, that's some, sometimes may be a little confusing at the beginning, but you'll get used to it. Uh, so the scan, mode is, uh, the scan mode has to be set to scan, which, he, which means the profile data. And the scan data storage has to be turned on to, to a full storage as well, in addition to changing the uh, scan, the acquisition mode. And the threshold can, is need to be set to zero. The step size so means, um, you know, the um, you know, how many, however many MAU you have per data points. You can go as as fine as 0.05, but 0.1 MAU per per point is more than sufficient. That that means 10 points per MAU. And the scan speed, we again need to, we like to set it to be the moderate, um, to be in the medium of the range, somewhere between one or 5,000 MU per second. Um, uh, in the LCMS system, uh, there is a, a, a capacity um, of, of enabling additional channels, including uh, polarity switching. You can switch between positive mode and negative mode and interleaving them. Um, uh, that's doable. Um, uh, it's also compatible with MassWorks, but we re recommend at the beginning, you stay with only a single mode, single polarity, either positive or negative to get started. And if you do like to do polarity switching later on, make sure you set up the mass spec mass method with the same polarity switching between the standard and the sample. And then you need to build a a, a, a polar, uh, build a polarity appropriate calibration for uh, the analysis, which means in the, in the positive mode, you need to build a positive mode calibration. In the negative mode, you need to build a negative mode calibration to apply to the uh, corresponding mode of the sample unknown analysis. It can be done, um, but uh, you do have to separate out the positive mode and the negative mode. MassWorks software is capable of doing that, but we suggest that you start with a single polarity to get familiarized it first. 
Uh, the newer um, acquisition system under OpenLabs CDS uh, 2.4 plus uh, or later, um, uh, the setup is um, uh, significantly uh, reduced in terms of complexity. So under auto acquire acquisition method, uh, you would change the data storage to, to profile mode and the scan speed that you can specify in terms of Hertz or in terms of however many MEU per, per, per cycle. Um, so uh, we again recommend the medium scan speed that's what, for the best possible performance. In terms of the standard used for the LCMSD, uh, the Edge and Tune solution is a very ideal standard. It's a wide M over the range. You can do it both positive and negative mode. It's very stable. It's readily available inside the instruments. And um, uh, you can do a 10 microliter loop injection to bypass the LC column because uh, the tune solution is not the best suited for uh, column separation. So, uh, so loop injection bypass the column is the best way to do it. And it can be very fast, one or two minutes. And we do, you inject this as an external standard. The instrument would drift throughout the day, but typically not more than five minutes out per day. So, which is within our error, error bound. Um, so that's a, um, a, a recommended uh, standard solution to use. Um, uh, Dr. Sawada-san from um, Agent Japan uh, has written two application notes with some clever ways of uh, introducing the standards. For example, for a polymer ap application, you can use the injector program after the LC separation to introduce the standard. And for a food application um, using ASAP Pro, you can use the infusion pump to introduce the standard as well. Uh, other standard, you can use um, um, internal um, uh, API, uh, active ingredients for pharmaceutical analysis, for example. And that's an internal standard. You don't have to do any extra experiments and, and everything comes within the same sample. So it's very easy, very convenient. The only downside is that it's a single standard calibration. It only cover a limited mass range of plus minus 100 Dalton from the, where the standard M over Z range is. So there are quite a few choices for LCMS in terms of standards. So I'd like to demonstrate to you a couple of features in the LCMSD um, through the actual software demo. Um, um, I will not go through the laundry list here, but um, this is just a, a note of uh, the couple of features that I like to cover. Um, in particular, some interesting new features that's available become, that's available in the version six, uh, for example, the singly charged monomer and doubly charged dimer, which makes an interesting mixture that's, uh, that can be analyzed in version six, the newly released software. And I'll show you also how to open um, how to access OpenNAP CDS data support, uh, which becomes available in version six. So with that, I will um, uh, switch uh, to MassWorks and do a quick demo for you. So this is the MassWorks. It's typically installed on your on your um, processing computer. Once it's installed, um, you can click the tasks here, and you can see right away there are two tasks. One is the calibration, one is analysis, which is uh, the two major functions of the software. The first time you got you get into the software, we like you to take a look at the help menu to confirm that you got the right version by clicking the about MassWorks under help. It'll tell you what kind of what kind of uh, license you have, and pay special attention to the support ID, which is a serial number. Um, um, uh, you can come, you can uh, code that number in your communication with us, and that's how we track the software um, and the and the, and uh, keep everything in our support system. So if you ever need to upgrade the software into a full version to support high res, for example we would need the, um, the serial number in order to process the remote license upgrade through so email. Uh, another useful, um, a very useful digital documents is, um, um, is uh, online help under contents. 
um, you will see that the, we have uh, a extensive production of the terminology of how to operate the software. It may be a little overwhelming, but really what you need to um, pay special attention to is under resources, the last section, uh, the, quick, the, the most important page is this single page, a quick guide to keyboard and mouse navigation in the software. Uh, so it tells you how to mark RT window, how to select the peaks, and how to um, um, room and auto scale and so on and so forth. So this, this page is, uh, is very important. I read through them, um, it'll do you really good. Uh, it'll be very helpful. And then before you run the first experiment, we, su we suggest you go to the resources and uh, read the documents on recommended first experiment, uh, which is linked to a PDF file. Uh, it described to you some of the requirements in how to set up the instruments to make the data acquisition. Um, if you want to read about the details on how to set up the GCMS uh, D system, there's a application notes here uh, that's linked on how to acquire data from Agent and GCMS D in the uh, good old Came Station, written by a uh, Agent and colleague Harry Press in Santa Clara, with a lot of details and, and explanations. Um, so those three are, are, the, are the very good uh, um, uh, starting points. Uh, another um, very good starting points, if you have another uh, uh, an, uh, half an hour or one hour, would be to go through the MathWorks quick start tutorial. Uh, go through the um, go through the first two sections: how to calibrate using a GCMS run, and how to calibrate using an LCMS run. So GCMS here, create the calibration, apply the calibration for analysis, and the LCMS, how to create the calibration and apply the calibration to the analysis. Uh, using all pre-installed um, data that's available to you to go through the process. Uh, so that's the electronic um, uh, help that's available to you at your fingertips at all time. Uh, and of course, you can reach out to us to, to ask for any help as well. Uh, so um, here I like to go through the GCMSD demo first uh, to go through a couple of key points. Um, so the uh, one of the key points is the auto auto cal feature in GCMS, which doesn't which would avoid doing the calibration by hand. You can go straight to analysis and open any data that has been acquired according to the instruction. And once you open the data. Um, once you open the data that comes uh, that comes with the install in this particular case, that's uh, under this particular directory, which I will show you. Um, under this directory, it's an OFN sensitivity run, basically. That's uh, set up to acquire in the profile mode. And once you go open the MS data, it will perform a calibration. If if uh, prior calibration is not does not exist, or it's going to use a prior calculated um, uh, calibration based on the PFTBA that's included in the run. So in this case, a prior calibration has already been established and by using the calibrate by using the calibration gas that's in core in, that's included in the run and it already applied the calibration. So you can actually click anywhere in the in the GC, in the GC trace, the tick chromatogram, it'll give you the accurate mass for all the peaks. And for this particular analyte, which is the OFN, uh, you can also get the accurate mass by averaging a small window or a large window. You can also move the window around. Those are all part of the mouse and keyboard navigation that's in the quick guide. Um, and then you can get the accurate mass here. Uh, this is a good sanity check to make sure everything's working using, using a pre-installed data. Um, and that mass should already be, be reasonably accurate. And you can then go and right click here to perform a clip search. And OFN contains CHNO plus possible flooring. So we put that in there. And we typically search within plus minus 20 mini Dalton, three sigma, just to be safe. Um, at the beginning, we don't uh, deal with that first. So let me clear, let me clear that out. Um, so if it's a molecular ion, you choose the RD electron. If it's um, a fragment ion, you perhaps need to pick um, both electron states. And those are the chemistry constraints. The double bond equivalence is explained in the documents. It's uh, related to chemistry. 
family rings and double bonds you have in the compound. Typically for unknown, we leave it wide open. And then we would search within a, uh, within a default profile range relative to monoisotope um, between minus one to 3.5. I will explain what that means. And then you can go and search for possible elemental compositions for the molecular ion here at 272. And we would naturally get a long list of possible candidates. Uh, it'll be sorted based on spectral accuracy. The one with the highest spectral accuracy um, would be on top of the list. We don't get the correct answer on top of the list all the time, but we do in this time. But it's typically within the top two or top three. And you can also blow it up to see how well the match is. It matches very well with 99.7% spectral accuracy. Um, and also at this point, you can search the um, you can search the library by sending the elemental composition to the this library, which should be which should be installed already. Um, as you can see, it will look for this particular elemental composition as molecular formula in the library, and indeed we find the OFN. Um, you can also send the um, elemental composition to the Chem Spider online on the web and see what the uh, chem spider says about possible structures. And again, in this case, we get the OFN um, as the only heat in the chem spider. Um, another uh, list library integration, you can do a conventional library search, not using the elemental composition we just did, but using the fragment, using the EI fragment spectrum. I just click anywhere else here and right click and do a library search, it will send, uh, send the EI spectrum to the this library and perform a search to see if the compound can be found in the library. And lo and behold, we found the right compound on top of the list with high match score in this case. Um, so that, um, um, that gives us the conventional this library search. But because we have accurate mass, you could actually point your mouse at the, at the accurate mass of the molecular ion and limit the search to find only the compound with the molecular mass, exact mass within plus minus the mass tolerance of the reported accurate mass by just going to do a library search by just clicking that particular mass while searching the library. In this case, it will only give you the library heat whose molecular ion would come, would, molecular ion exact mass would come within a mass tolerance of the reported accurate mass of 271.9849. In this case, we get the OP, we get the, the um, um, uh, OFN as the top four heats. There's only one extra heat. By chance, the molecular ion happened to be within the plus minus mass tolerance range of the measured accurate mass. So you get the much reduced, much simpler heat list because of the accurate mass in this case. So I'd like to, um, I'd like to show you while we are here, a very interesting fragment of structural elucidation function, which, is, um, uh, which has to do with the uh, mixture analysis. You see here we have the 252, a, a smaller, a smaller fragments and 240 here and other uh, more significant fragments. You can actually use MassWorks to perform the fragment analysis by using ion series here. That comes with the Eclipse elemental composition search. The way to do that is to uh, include the 252 in the analysis. So 252 from 272, or uh, 253 rather, from 272 is a 19 difference. That's most likely a mass of fluorine. And the 240, uh, 241 to 272, that's, um, that's likely involved another carbon involved, the, two, the minus the loss of CF, CF group. And you can test the hypothesis to see if the a fragment would indeed make sense by enlarging the profile range to calculate the spectral accuracy width. So here we would go all the way back to minus 33. And with that, you can search the, the, seg the segment of this, of this spectrum 
and get the idea on the possible, the, how plausible that fragment elucidation might make sense. As you can see, we're getting 99.5% spectral accuracy with very good fit to the molecular ion, to the 253, and to the 241. So they are most likely the correct fragment fragments. And if you move your mouse over, you can actually get the relative concentrations of those fragments. At, you know, the molecular ion at, this, at about 67%, 3% of the loss of fluorine, and 30% uh, of a loss of CF. Uh, you can go and analyze the other sections of the spectrum similarly, or you can include more and more fragments into the analysis. So that's a very useful structural elucidation and fragment analysis tool. Uh, before I finish the GCMSD, I'd like to show you um, a, a couple of reports, a very simple reporting function that uh, you can use for your record. Uh, if you want to uh, get the, um, get the uh, images of the chromatogram and the mass spec, you can uh, go to edit menu and say copy report to clipboard. And that would allow you to copy a image as a report, which should, uh, which should reflect the chromatogram and the spectral overlay and the mass spec. You can also uh, send the report of the, of the elemental composition determination to clipboard, which would also create another image file, including the search condition for the elemental composition, the date and timestamp, and the search results. So, that, so those are the two simple reports that you can save for your records. Um, so with that, I will uh, switch gear uh, to show you the LCMSD. Um, so for LCMSD, we still have to do a manual calibration by hand. So you would click the calibration button under the task, and then we would go open mass spec data um, to, to do the, uh, to do the um, manual calibration with. So here we have a um, LCMSD data that's already acquired using the loop injection of the, um, of the agent and tune solution in a two minutes run. So you can see that's where the tune compound comes off. And you can follow the, uh, the quick guide to mark the RT window. We get the average mass spec to do the calibration with. And then you go to the standard ions tab here. Uh, to, this is where you enter the elemental composition of the, um, of the standard ions. Uh, for the uh, agent and tune solution. Fortunately, today we already built in this table for you. All you need to do is to move the mouse over at the bottom of the screen and say load ions. Uh, that should take you to the uh, default um, uh, installation data directory where there's, uh, there's agent and pre-built um, calibration files. And we are looking for electro spray plus ion between 100 and 1000. So you open that, that will automatically fill in the elemental composition for the various, um, for the various uh, standards that you want to use for the calibration. You might need to adjust the, the, uh, the window, uh, the shaded window for various standards so that um, the, um, the window starts from baseline and ends at the baseline. And that's it, that, those are the standard ions that we're gonna use for the calibration, the four standard ions. And then you go to calibrate, you say go. And that's at the end of it, you get the review page and that review page uh, would um, give you some indication of how well the calibration is working. For example, in this case, the Delta M, the, ma the, the, the mass recovery is somewhat high at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 6.6 and 9.2. And they are all, uh, they all tend to be positive errors, a few mini delta a, a little too high. That's typically an indication that the calibrated peak shape after calibration is too wide. And all, this is perhaps the only adjustment you need to make. And all you need to do is to go back to calibrate and view and edit and change the, the peak width to a narrower peak width of 20% wider instead of 30% wider after calibration. 
and then you say go, and then you see the, um, then you take a look at the Delta M, the mass recovery, they are all within five mini Delta, and take a look at the spectral accuracy, they are all 99 and above. So that's a satisfactory calibration. You can save the calibration. I will save it as this calibration. Uh, it's a small calibration file you can use for analysis later on. So I will save that. And this calibration report, you can also go edit. Under edit, say copy and report to clipboard. You can also copy and paste that as an image file to keep as a, um, as a record for your for your own record keeping as the calibration file that's built today and under what, under what conditions and which data file and the mass recovery, the spectral accuracy. So that's another uh, piece of um, a, a one page report that may be useful. And then at the end of that, you, you, the calibration is all finished, calibration file saved. You go to analysis and under analysis, you would go and open a sample run. In this case, it's a reserving sample run. Um, go open the .ms file under analysis, and then you go here to, to apply the calibration, which is what we just created. You go navigate to where the calibration file has been saved. You say open, that's uh, applied. So this is the 609 after calibration after averaging the peak and after calibration. That's for the reserving. Then you can go and search for the possible elemental composition by right click here, go to a clip search, consider CHNO plus minus 20 mini Dalton. Electro spray uh, is uh, even electron. And then you go search for possible elemental compositions. So we get quite a few heats. It's sorted based on spectral accuracy. The correct heat is, uh, is resurping here as the number two heat with 99.3% spectral accuracy and one mini Dalton mass error. And again, this, uh, this page can be, can be copy and pasted as a, uh, as a report by just right click, say report to clipboard. You can save the report as, not, as well as the chromatogram and the mass back window by going to edit, copy report to clipboard. Uh, I'm running a little late, I noticed, um, but let me show you a, the last, um, uh, uh, the last um, uh, uh, significant feature, which is uh, how to, um, how to uh, access OpenNAP CDS data. I'm going to bypass the singly charged and doubly charged timer analysis, uh, leave that for the future. That's a new feature available in version six. So instead, I would um, go and show you the OpenNAP CDS data support available in version six. In order to switch to um, OpenNAP CDS data support, you have to close MassWorks and come back to the come back to the uh, CERNO uh, program group to to run the file access uh, switch, MassWorks file access switch. As it's default to Mass Hunter, you need to switch it to Agent and Open Lab. So once you say OK, you can go restart MassWorks, which should allow you now to open, either under calibration or analysis, a Open Lab CDS data that's acquired in the profile mode. So you say Open Mass Back Data, and then here I have some. Um, um, some open lab CDS data that's acquired um, in an agent and demo lab in Boston, um, courtesy of uh, Patrick Yorkonic, Patrick uh, Cronin. Um, so here I can go load this reserving run, for example, .dx file. And once it's inside the MassWorks, all the calibration step, analysis step is the same. So you can see the 609, the reserving peak, you can average, uh, you can average across a whole bunch of scans and, and get the raw reserving uh, signal. So with that, I will, um, I will su summarize it up, go back to the PowerPoint for you. Um, I'll give you a quick summary. 
before we switch it um, to the last part of the um, of this of the webinar. So you made a very good investment with MassWorks, as you can see. Um, it can be can be done with easy uh, with this, uh, to, to perform a a, a very convenient calibration to get accurate mass. And pitch shape is very important for spectral accuracy. You can do elemental composition in a real chromatographic time scale. It's a great research and, ma and manual tool for unknown ID um, by hand using one ion at a time. It can do fragment analysis and mixture analysis. Um, so it's all a research tool. In the, in the years that we have been interacting with customers like yourself, well, we have heard so much feedback for a desire for a fully automated uh, solution that incorporates the, um, all, the, all the nice features, but to be able to do all the analysis in a fully automated um, fashion in a whole run for all the peaks, uh, which is the reason we produce a new piece of software called GCID um, that, um, that will perform automatically GCMS analysis, which I will let um, uh, my colleague Dan um, give you a short introduction to. Don? Yeah, thanks, Dong Dong. Uh, yeah, we're running a bit over for, so I think the best thing to do is, uh, uh, Yang Gong, why don't we answer the questions coming in? And then uh, uh, for those of you that have to leave us, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do the overview of the new software at the end. And we'll, we'll, we will be sending out a link to that, to this presentation. So if you wanna pre review that and you don't have time today, you can go back uh, and take a look at that. So uh, uh, Yang Gong, you wanna, we have, we have about th only about three questions right now. So you want to go and just answer those uh, live? Sure. So, let me go so, there. so I'll get it. So the first one, the first question is, uh, how is RMSE, is, how is it calculated? Okay, so I'll say RMSE is a statistical, statistical terminology. It stands for root mean squared error, which really means, um, um, which really means that the, uh, uh, the sum of the squares of the errors calculated at each m over z channel and then divide divided by the number of channels and then take the square root so it's an indication of the residual between residual difference between the theoretical mass spec and uh, the calibrated mass spec okay and uh, uh the next question is uh for GCMS, open valve calibration, is it required for every run? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, it's not required, um, um, uh, although, it can, although you can do it for every single run because it's so easy to do. Um, if, you don't pre if you don't like to, uh, to do it in every single run, we have um, found as long as you don't retune the mass back system, the calibration would stay for three weeks at a time. So you don't have to do it in every single run. You can, you can do it every day, once every day, once every week, or once every two or three weeks. As long as, one, the um, mass spec does not get tuned during the process. Every time you tune it, you have to recalibrate. And as long as you acquire the mass spec under the same condition, the same starting mass, the same uh, handing mass, the same scan rate, um, then the calibration should hold for many days, if not weeks at a time. Okay, and then, uh, the, and, and again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to just uh, type in your question and, and Yang Dong or I will be glad to answer it. We have one more question. And the question is uh, in uh, uh, GCMSD, uh, is it possible for LCMSD to perform the calibration after a run? I think the, I think the question is probably that uh, in, is can you, can you perform a calibration after the run and, and, and not yeah, yeah. before the run? Uh huh. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, definitely that's definitely possible, and the results will be exactly the same. You don't have to perform the calibration beforehand. You can perform the calibration afterwards, uh, and that, there's a good uh, there's a good experimental reason for that sometimes as well, because um, 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 you can run your sample first and then do the um, calibration afterwards because the calibration compound, depending on which one you use, sometimes may be uh, difficult to get rid of after the run. So if you want to uh, run your sample clean first and then run the tune compound 
uh, last before you go home in the evening and then have, um, have, have many opportunities to clean out the system afterwards. That's, uh, that's something you can do uh, to your advantage. Okay, and then we have another question which uh, says, I can see that you can import files from Open Lab CDS from the File Explorer. Any plans to support network Open Lab solutions where you need to interface to shared services? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, um, uh, Dan, do you? I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not really uh, totally familiar with the API there. Um, we, right now, we're, it's a file-based uh, open, and I assume there's an API to talk to the network solution. Um, right now, we don't support it. Um, we haven't had any requests from customers. Basically, we've been driven by customer requests, Agilent customer requests, requests. and in conjunction with Agilent, we've, uh, uh, we've added some of these additional features. So uh, if it's something that's important to you, I suggest that uh, you push back uh, on, the, on the people at Agilent. They, they, they're very receptive to uh, add this. But right now, we don't have plans. But again, if there's a demand for it, I'm sure